Good morning. Good morning. We walked through our worship this morning and rejoiced to be able to gather together as God's people in this house. Pastor Holly is in uh, uh, Prairie Town this morning. He's doing their confirmation. And of course, they're well aware that we have the installation there uh, this afternoon. Uh, some of the pastors in the circuit think it's not fair that Pastor Holly only had a vacancy of a few months instead of two and a half years like Pastor Schultz had. And they think that he's due for a couple more vacancies, but uh, we'll see. Uh, at any rate, we're very happy that uh, uh, there's a pastor now coming to uh, Prairie Town that pretty much fills up our circuit. Uh, we had, just had somebody come to Jerseyville about a month ago, and now we have only a couple more vacant congregations in our circuit. Today in the church here is Trinity Sunday. We celebrate the fact that God is triune. Now, we don't quite understand uh, that God is three in one, or three, and He's completely three, completely one at the same time. Uh, as has bugged the church throughout the years, throughout history, they keep trying to understand it. And every time they come up with something they think that God had all figured out, we call it heresy because it's something we celebrate and not try to comprehend. How God can be completely three, completely one at the same time, just beyond our ability to comprehend. It's also the Sunday of the church here where we use the Athanasian Creed, uh, which is the longest of the creeds. Uh, so we have three creeds. We have the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, and the uh, Athanasian Creed. Tradition is that the apostles wrote that each of the 12 apostles, when they got ready to go out, um, they said, well, what are you going to talk about? And then each one of them had one of the petitions of the Apostles' Creed. Of course, that's not true, uh, but that's, the, that's how it got its name. Uh, the Nicene Creed was the creed of the Church of Nicaea. Uh, it was used during a period of controversy over the person of Christ, or who Jesus was. Uh, and it was, it was, it was added uh, it then. The Athanasian Creed was probably originally a hymn. The Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed were both originally baptism, the baptism creeds. So when somebody was baptized, they would confess their faith. That was the source of those two creeds. The Athanasian Creed was probably a hymn. Uh, it was named after Athanasius because he was one of the champions of the faith in the fight against a, a, a heretic by the name of Arius. Athanasius, the history of Athanasius is fascinating. He had a flea for his life several different times, depending on who was the emperor. So when the emperor agreed with Athanasius, with uh, Arius, Athanasius quit. Uh, when they agreed with Athanasius, he came back. So uh, anyway, he probably didn't write it, but we, we kind of name it after him as the mind where he's a hero of the heroes of the faith, focusing on the, the person of the real real divinity of Christ, which was what the very person is about, what is Jesus really God, isn't it? Uh, and so that's what we're going to do that when it comes. So we get to use it today, and as you know, so we're going to read it, we're going to have to read it uh, piece by piece. We're going to read some, I read some, everybody reads some, and then read some. Otherwise, we get tired of reading this verse. We get now as we worship by singing the first year. <laughs>
Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who grants us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended to you, and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them. And I pray for your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, their sufferings and death, of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this your confession, I by virtue of my office, I call your days of your Christ, and by his authority, announce the grace of God to all of you. And in the stead, by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Blessed be the Holy Trinity and the undivided unity. Let us give glory to Him, because He has shown His mercy to us. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is Your name in all the earth.
The Lord be with you.
all people will rise again, and their bodies will be an account to save their own deeds. And those who have done good will enter into eternal life, those who have done evil into eternal fire. This is the Christian faith. One who does not believe it faithfully and firmly cannot be saved. Can you see it for them? Rabbi, we know 
that you are a teacher having come from God, for no one is able to do these things unless what you do, if God is not with him. Because of the signs that Jesus has done, Nicodemus is convinced that Jesus is from God. He's convinced that God is at work in Jesus. But then there's another thing that John tells us about Nicodemus, and that is that he was a Pharisee. He was a man of power. He was part of the Jewish ruling establishment. And as such, he would have assumed that he was guaranteed a place in the kingdom of God. <clears throat> now we also know that this assumption was typically true of the Jewish population in general. They were convinced that simply because they were connected with Abraham, they had a spot in the kingdom. But as a Pharisee, and a religious teacher and leader of the nation, Nicodemus would have believed that his membership in the kingdom was absolutely guaranteed. But the response of Jesus would have come as a total shock to Nicodemus, blowing his mind. Jesus tells him, Truly, truly, I say to you, if someone is not born anew, he is not able to enter, to see the kingdom of God. In essence, <clears throat> Jesus is telling Nicodemus that as things currently stand, no matter what you might think, Nicodemus, you are not in God's kingdom. These words of Jesus, then, are a challenge to Nicodemus to basically rethink his assumptions, to rethink everything he's already always believed. He needs to rethink how someone attains the kingdom of God, but more important, he needs to rethink just who this Jesus is. Well, the response of Nicodemus demonstrates that he's completely baffled. How can this be? I'm a grown man. There's no way I'm going to crawl back into the womb of my mother and be born again. Jesus explains further. To get into the kingdom, you have to be born of the water and the spirit. Because if you are not, there is no way you can get into the kingdom. Now Nicodemus is even more confused. How can this thing happen, he says? Or, as we might put it, what in the world are you talking about? When Jesus responds, at first glance, it seems like his reply is a put-down. He says to Nicodemus, you are a teacher of Israel, and you do not know these things? But actually, these words of Jesus illustrate that the, what it means simply cannot be figured out. Even those who are in the best position to know about the kingdom can't get it right. Jesus then reminds Nicodemus that no one can talk about what they don't know or witness what they've not seen, which is kind of obvious. But in any extent, it explains why he, which, and that explains why Nicodemus has no idea what Jesus is talking about. But then as Jesus continues, he says, I can talk about it. I can talk about how it gets to the end of the kingdom of God because I know, I've seen, I've been there. I'm the one having come down from heaven. Essentially, Nicodemus now has to rethink not only what he always understood about what the kingdom was, but his perception of Jesus. Jesus is clearly, in the, clearly claiming here to be a lot more than a teacher come from God. Next, Jesus explains what it will take to be in the kingdom of God by going back to an incident that occurred a long time ago during Israel's 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. God's people were grumpy. They were complaining to God. God why don't you bring us out in the wilderness to die? Oh, and not to mention, God, we're really, really tired of this crummy man that you've given us. Well, God's heading up to his high hands. And he sends fiery serpents among the people. And whoever is bitten, he dies. Well, then, true to form, as God's people see the problem they cause for themselves, they repent, and they plead with Moses to fix it. Moses does what they want, they praise the Lord. The Lord's answer is to raise up a bronze serpent on a pole 
And whoever is bitten, if they look at the bronze serpent in the pool, they'll be saved from the punishment they earned by their rebellion. And lo and behold, that's exactly what happens. So, Nicodemus, Jesus tells him, being in the kingdom of God, in God's kingdom, being longing to God, is going to take something being hung up on a pole. Only in this case, it won't be a serpent. It'll be the Son of Man, me, that is lifted up on that pole. I'm far more than a rabbi. I have come to be lifted up, and those who look to me will be saved. Nicodemus, I'm the way into the kingdom, the only way into the kingdom. I am the way that you can get the treasure. And in addition, Nicodemus, in me, not only do you know the way into the kingdom, but you also know what God is really like. God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son in order that all the ones believing in him not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not commission his son to, into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. And then Jesus concludes by explaining why he is the only way into the kingdom. He says, the reason I did not come into the world to condemn the world is really quite simple. The world is condemned already. By nature, every single individual, when they are born, are separated from God or <coughs> condemned because of their sin. And Nicodemus, that's your status right now, condemned. And if you refuse to believe that I have come to forgive you, to forgive sin, and may make sinners part of the kingdom, you are going to stay that way. You will stay condemned. You will stay outside of God's kingdom. Now exactly how Nicodemus responded at this point, John doesn't tell us. Or we do know that later, Nicodemus comes to the defense of Jesus before the Jewish council when they're discussing how to get rid of him. We also know that after Jesus is crucified, Nicodemus, along with Joseph of Arimathea, take the body from Jesus from the cross and bury him. So our assumption is that Nicodemus eventually does come to believe and does come to enter the kingdom. But the point that John makes as he relates this discussion between Nicodemus and Jesus is clear enough. It's about Jesus and his mission. Jesus came to be lifted up on the cross to take away sin. And he is the one and only way by which anyone can enter God's kingdom, by which anyone can enter and get receive that treasure. Well, on the one hand, we hear that and we say, well, I know, I believe that. I'm one of those whose sins have been taken away by Jesus. I'm in God's kingdom, and we can rejoice in that. But on the other hand, when we hear that, it's easy for us to keep it on a personal level. By that I mean, we think, well, I'm okay doesn't seem to occur, to occur to us, to give a second thought to anybody else, to that multitude that Jesus described as condemned already and going to stay that way. Because that's the way people are. If you don't confess Jesus and have your sins forgiven, you're condemned and you're going to stay that way. The result of our kind of forgetting that is that we tend not to talk about Jesus being the only way into the kingdom. We tend to avoid mentioning to people that by, na that they, by nature they're sinners, and that by nature right now they're already condemned. They're separated by God, cut off, and are going to receive his punishment as the just wage of their sin. In fact, we don't like to think about all those people whose lives touch on us regularly, but do not believe in Jesus. We don't like to think about that in reality, they are simply marking time here on this earth until they die, at which point they go to hell. And even when we do, we are tempted to expand the ways by which an individual can enter God's kingdom to kind of conform to how we wish it might be. 
We tend to assert that apart from Jesus, all mankind is condemned. It doesn't seem fair. What about people from other cultures who've never heard of him? Is that fair? After all, God's love, isn't he? I don't think he would do that. And so we conclude, or we imagine, there must be other ways into the kingdom. And in our active imaginations, we can always come up with the answers we want. Or at least it looks like we think that way. When you consider how rarely we proclaim Jesus to those who are still condemned. Unless the answer is we don't care what happens to them. So these words of Jesus to Nicodemus do two things. First of all, they point us to the joyful assurance that we are citizens of the kingdom of God because Jesus came to be lifted up on the cross in order to give sinners eternal life. But second, these words also point us to the stark reality that by nature, all people are condemned. And without faith in Jesus, they're going to stay that way. That means that each of us, by nature, started off condemned. And by our, and by our daily sins, we still deserve to be condemned. But all that changed in baptism. We were given faith. And our faith in Jesus takes away our condemnation. We will not perish because our faith in Jesus saves us. We have that eternal life. We are in the, in the kingdom. We have the treasure. We know and believe that one message that also has the power to change the fate of everybody else who is still condemned and will perish. But that message isn't going to do them any good if they don't hear it. And when it is proclaimed, then the Holy Spirit has the opportunity to work in them so that they too believe, they too become citizens of the kingdom, they too receive the treasure. It's as we grow in our own grasp of the transition that has happened to us as a result of our faith in Jesus, instead of being condemned within God's kingdom, that we see how important it is for the same transition to occur in those who are still under the condemnation so may this constant awareness of how our faith in Jesus transfer us from those who are condemned to those who are being saved cause our faith to grow. Grow so that we proclaim that message that Jesus died on the cross so that those who are condemned by their sins may be forgiven, incorporated into that kingdom, and receive the treasure. Amen. And now may the peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Jesus and the life of the rest. Amen. We continue with the same of the heart.
We rise for prayer. O oh, blessed Holy Trinity, before your heavenly throne, we bring our prayers and petitions, our supplications and praise. For you have commanded us so to pray and have promised to hear us. Give attention to our requests, O oh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as we, your children, cling to your, our, your promises. O oh, Father, you are without beginning, without end, made of none, neither created nor begotten. With your mighty hand, you sustain all creation. You cause the rain to fall, the earth to bear abundance. You provide daily bread to the just and the unjust. Stir thankless hearts to acknowledge your providential care and to look to you in every need. Turn your loving eye and your healing hand to all those in need. We join with those who give thanks for healing and ask you to increase the right use of the medical arts among all people. For you have conquered death through your own son's death. Therefore, comfort those who mourn with the hope of the resurrection of the dead to life everlasting. Grant peace throughout the world and in our land. Rightly use the armed forces of this nation to defend the innocent, maintain justice, and establish peace when there is no peace. You, O Father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, lead your people in all ventures in this life and attend to their every need. Watch over all who travel, whether near or far, and grant the presence of your holy angels to guide us in all our ways, whether in work or leisure. Make our homecomings joyful, and for your care we receive our thanks and praise. O Son of God, you are the Father alone, either made and created or God. In birth you took our flesh, and in your death you conquered our death. Preserve us from the assaults of Satan, as our prophet, we thank you for your saving word and implore you to stir up your church to take that word of life to the ends of the earth. Sustain our congregations, upholding all pastors as they proclaim both your word of condemnation and your word of forgiveness, and instill in your people a love for the truth of your word. As our priests, we thank you for the all atoning sacrifice of the sins of the whole world, showing us the loving faith, heart, and love. Heavenly Father, we ask that the works accomplished in your kingdom flow from the sure and certain knowledge that you alone are our Savior. As our King, we thank you for preserving your kingdom in power in order that many more might be brought into your kingdom of grace. We ask you to preserve your people in all trials and temptations, discord and strife, and to hasten the coming of your kingdom of glory. O Holy Spirit, you are the Father, you are the Father and the Son, neither made nor created nor begotten, but proceeding. In your coming through word and sacrament, you seek to teach all things, and bring to our remembrance all the Lord Jesus has taught us. You have called us by the gospel, and kindled in us the desire and hope of eternal life. We pray that you continue to call people of every tribe, language, nation, creating in stubborn and unbelieving hearts faith in the only Savior of the world, Jesus Christ. Whether two or two or three or many more gather together, your holy people, so that they may receive forgiveness and strength through the Lord's sacraments. Prepare the hearts of your people to receive the body and blood of our Redeemer, Jesus Christ, and thus be forgiven and sustained. Strengthen us, that we may serve both God and neighbor in purity and holiness. Preserve the whole Christian church on earth and in this place. And on the last day, that we may be raised to everlasting life and take the eternal life of all the faithful. And we pray, O oh God, that you might be with all who have very various needs. Particularly, we remember Christopher, Craig, Dale, David, Ed, Joyce, Linda, Mark, Maxine, Paul, Ray, Shannon, Terry, and Tim. Be with them in their needs and comfort them with your presence. Remember that you will, you will never leave them or forsake them, but you will do all things for their good. O blessed Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to you will be all praise, honor, and glory, and power. But from you and through you and to you are all things. To you be the glory for now and forever. service in the sacrament. The Lord be 